This is reporting on Rails, Active Record, and OLAP working together. My name is Tony. I'm one of the senior developers at Moby. I'm on what we call the billing and reporting team. Uh, together, the team manages over, quote unquote, one million devices under management. That's from marketing. I don't know if that's true, but <laughs> I was told I could say that. Um, and and um, I've had about seven years experience with Rails, 10 years total with the professional web development. So at Moby, what I essentially do is I take billing data from carriers, uh, call center tickets, various orders from end users, shove them into Postgres, throw in a dash of magic, and eventually out comes pretty charts and graphs. So today what I'm going to talk about is what exactly is reporting? And believe it or not, there's actually a series of standard industry terminology to describe reporting, specifically OLAP, which I'm going to get into later. And when you work with report, when you work with reporting, you actually have to organize, you have to think of your data slightly differently. You can't just throw everything into five different tables and hope they all glue together just fine and hope that your queries don't take five minutes to run if you want one single number out of it. And uh, taking all this terminology, how to set up your data, how much can Rails get, with, get to you out of the box, pretty much. So for this, since we're talking about Rails, we'll use a blog as an example. Uh, let's say you are a lead developer for a company called Medium. It's a blog site like Medium, only better. You have a pretty large amount of users, a crap ton of blog entries. Each, each user, uh, each blog can have more than one author. You have uh, users leaving comments, slash trolling, whatever you want on that. And this is what a typical blog as a service site might look like. You have main blog object, users, which double as comment leavers and, comment, and uh, blog writers. Uh, users can rate uh, blog posts. Uh, we, uh, we track um, who views each blog every time for basic analytics. Blogs have categories, posts have categories. Um, it's very, very basic Rails app, pretty much. So it'll eventually happen. It'll happen to most Rails apps, I think, as, as companies grow. Um, boss will come to you and say, hey, we have a lot of data. Um, I want to know more about it. Create a series of uh, the dreaded word dashboards for various users to see this data and make decisions. In this example, we're going to make a couple dashboards, one for the authors and one for the owners of the site. All blog authors would need, want to see you know, how their blogs are doing, who's viewing them, uh, how many, you know, how many posts are each of their authors doing, which one's more popular, which categories are pulling more views in. And oh yeah, um, they can take those dashboards and add a little extra slicing and dicing in their whim pretty much. So where exactly do you begin? You have a very simple Rails app with a bunch of data and you need to set it up in a way where you can churn out charts and graphs on a whim pretty much. Well, first you have to understand what reporting actually is. So in this case, data is stored in our relational database management systems. Completely worthless to everybody. Humans cannot make do with any, with any data. It's just all numbers, it's all strings. You spit out all the blog posts in an Excel sheet, hand it to someone, they have no idea what to do with it. What we can work with is information. The idea is reporting turns data, which is useful to computers, into information in which humans can actually understand and make decisions with. More specifically, reporting answers questions. So what kind of questions? Well, it depends on who's actually viewing reports. So here's a couple examples for the owners of our blog site. Um, you know. We have 50 uh, categories. How many blogs are being uh, blog entries are being made for each category? Or you know, how many more users are we getting month to month over the past quarter or so? And also, which posts are you know the most active ones? Which ones can we maybe promote to the front of, to the front of the entire site to get more traffic through that way? And blog authors obviously want to know more information about their blogs. They want to know you know, I've made. 20 blog posts from these three categories. 
you know, which ones, which category of type of thing I talk about is more popular compared to the other ones. Or if you, ha or if you have a blog with five authors, which, which one of my authors are actually cranking out more content than the others. This is what reporting answers, essentially. And the, and the, I would say the biggest key when designing or implementing reporting into a website is get the questions you want to answer up front. Otherwise, you are left in the dark, basically throwing spaghetti at the wall. Hey, maybe they want to know about this. Maybe our users care about this. No, figure out what you actually want to ask, answer first before you really dive into anything. So that's great. We know what we want to ask. We know we want to do reporting. So how do we do it? Well, one of the more common ways of reporting is implementing OLAP, online analytical processing. Uh, big, long definition, business intelligence, analytical comp calculations, scary stuff. Uh, with OLAP, commonly, all of the data in of various databases, various sources, are combined in what's called data cubes. Commonly, they all live in memory. So you can have gigabytes and terabytes of data pre-set up, all shoved into memory for quick querying. And commonly, this data is pre-sorted by um, various what are called dimensions, which I'll get into later. So for example, for uh, an OLAP warehouse for sales data, you would have pre-built stuff for a buyer has bought these many widgets over this period of time, broken down already by period, by um, date, by month, by quarter, by year, already set out. And basically, well, commonly you report on stuff month over month over month over the past year. Um, Sometimes, commonly you don't report on up to the minute information. OLAP is essentially everything's said and done, here's the result from the previous period. You can uh, use um, uh, basically other analytical tools to project where sales are going or wherever you want to do with that information. And commonly you're dealing with aggregate information, so counts, maximums, minimums, who's, our, who's my most active uh, sales guy compared to the, most, to the sales guy that's doing nothing, et cetera, et cetera. That's great, except OLAP is expensive. Commonly you think OLAP, you think of features in Oracle or MS SQL, various other vendors. We don't want to do that. What we can do is use our OLAP, Relational Online Analytic Processing, which is great because this is OLAP built for databases. It talks to databases not in some weird language, some weird what-if scenario that you have to format, but in queries. Everyone essentially understands SQL. And everything is already organized in your tables with your relations that Rails sets up for you. And what's kind of nice about our OLAP, unlike regular OLAP, is you can work on both what is called transactional data and warehouse data. Data that is essentially shoved into the corner, uh, accumulates over time, so you can see past month, years, whatever you want, in current day stuff. So orders coming in right this minute, support tickets coming in right this minute. Uh, our OLAP has the ability to basically use reporting functionality for both types of data. And commonly, you want to organize your data in what's called a star schema or snowflake schema. I'll get into that a little bit later. But that is the overwhelming drive to organizing your data for it to work well with our OLAP, or work at all with it, for that matter. Before I get going, a couple notes about how we're going to set this up in a Rails app is we don't want bloat. We want to answer a question, a single question. How many blogs per category were made over the past 30 days? Uh, how many comments were left yesterday for this one blog for these sets of blog entries? We want to use Active Record, but we don't want Active Record stuff back. Active Record is relative is a pretty heavy library, and if all you want is a count, there is no reason to have an entire object loaded into memory like that. Also, you know, you don't want because a Active Record object is essentially one row in a table. You only care about one column out of it, really. So there's no reason to load the entire row up, for example, as well. 
Instead, what we want is something very generic, something that anything can act upon, in our case, an array of result sets from the database. What's nice about that is a simple Ruby object. You can JSONify it or do whatever you want with it, shove it into a nice charting framework for your front end. Works pretty well. So class time, uh, here are all the uh, terminologies that OLAP essentially functions with. There will be a test after this, so get your notes out. We're going to go through all of these. The idea is we're getting into the realm of business intelligence, which is different from the day-to-day -day terminology that you work with. What's nice is there's commonly an OLAP term that maps one to, almost one-to-one -one with a SQL term, which matches up with a Rails term. So we're going to start with a fact table, or I've seen some papers uh, calling them fact models. I prefer fact model personally. A fact model is your starting point for your entire report. It's uh, basically comprised, it is the main table where most of the information that you want lives. Or you can easily go from that table to something else very quickly to get the information that you want. A facts table typically is comprised of numeric columns, so uh, you know, uh, price for a sale, uh, various IDs for other tables or basic relations. In SQL land, it's the from clause. So you're going to select account from something from your main table, essentially. In Rails land, this is your active record model because that is the base of any query that active record runs is the model. So two quick, two quick uh, questions you want to answer. In this case, you can get your fact model very simply out of it by saying, what are you reporting on? You're reporting on blogs, you're reporting on posts. You have a blogs table, you have a posts table. Those are your fact models where you start with. Dimension allows you to take that fact model and slice and dice data. Uh, for, so for example, in a sales data warehouse, a sales rep for the sale is a dimension. Group stuff by a sales rep. Find, find sales only done by this specific sales rep. The date of the purchase. You want to see everything from the previous month. Uh, let's see here. Uh, or another example is show me you know, various orders that are in these specific states. Group them by state. How many are in these states? Uh, you know, we have 5,000 orders stuck in pre-processing. Hmm, maybe we should look into that. Or majority of our stuff is in basically the finalized state. While we, ha we have this big backload of finalizing orders and everything else is getting backed up. In SQL land, a dimension is commonly a join plus a group by. Especially if you're in Postgres where you have to follow the SQL spec. In Rails land, this is any has one or belongs to relation in your model or a regular attribute. You can group by a column on the fact model, for example. Or you can group by a user from a relation group by their username, for example. So using, these, so using these two questions, our dimension is category. Commonly, when you ask a reporting-esque reporting question, look for the keyword by. So I want to see you know, all my orders grouped by sales rep. Uh, I want to see all my posts grouped by the blog's authors, for example. Inside a dimension, we have what are called a hierarchy. This allows you to drill up and drill down uh, through various bits, of uh, various bits of dimension. So for example, I want to see all of my sales you know, by the individual. So show me all of the sales broken down by the date that they were ordered. Great. Now group them by month. You're going a step up in the dimension. Now group them by quarter. Now group them by year. And you can go back and forth as all you want. Uh, using an example in Moby, you could say, show me all of my lines of service grouped by the model of phone. That's the lowest level. So your Samsung Galaxy S7s, your iPhone 6s, iPhone 5s, those individual models of phones would be the lowest level of a dimension that you can group by. Then you move up to manufacturer. Okay, show me all my Samsung and um, Apple devices. 
OS, show me Android and iOS, wireless technology, CDMA versus GSM, etc., etc. The dimension hierarchy, basically you define a way for people to go in to the most detailed in group or pull back out to the highest level you can. A dimension member, so if you group by a sales rep, in this case, on the fact model will be a, like a sales rep ID, great, you have a count and a number, the foreign key. Another count and a foreign key, that's great. That tells you absolutely nothing to a human. Instead, what uh, dimensions implement are what called members, or Moby calls them labels. The idea is when you are joining against another table for reporting, you actually want to show them a different column in the table. So group, every, so group all my blog posts by their author, you jump to the author's table, group by that, and you show their username, for example. So you end up with a count and a username in your chart, a count and another username. Etc. Etc. Uh, as I mentioned before, your fact tables or fact models you can group by regular columns on the table. In this case, the label would be the actual column. So if you're grouping by a certain a bunch of orders by their state, the state actually lives on the fact table. That is also the label. So you see count opened, count closed, count in process, etc. Etc. Moving on. Next up is we call dimension filters. This is actually not an OLAP term, but OLAP really has no way, as far as I can see, to filter by stuff. Commonly, you just say, I want to see stuff within this period and group them by this thing, and I want it, you know, the average number of this. So with our OLAP, you kind of make up a term called filters. In this case, it's the where clause in your query. Show me. Uh, all of my blog posts grouped by author. Oh, but I'm going to add a filter. I just want to see these two authors, to see them side by side. I don't want to see all the authors for my blog. I just want to see these two. That's an example of a filter. Or in Moby's term, show me all of my Samsung devices, period. So you may have a pie chart that has one whole thing in it, but you can see another table with broken down Samsung-based devices if you want. So like I said, it's essentially the where clause. In Railsland, this is the where method on active relation. Any scope, because that essentially implements where clauses and other joins. Or if you feel uh, adventurous, ransack, which essentially does filtering for you through a nice DSL. Next up, we have a measure, which is essentially um, how do I want to aggregate stuff together. It's essentially an aggregate. Sum, max, min, count, average, whatever else SQL defines. I think those are mostly it. In this case, this is just a column in your main fact table. So if you're doing a count, you're essentially just summing the rows. If you're doing uh, you know, total total revenue generated, you go through your sales table and you sum the price columns. In this case, the measure is the price column and you're summing by it. And a metric kind of glues this all together. A metric is the, basically the report, the thing that you actually want. It is your question that you're answering. In this case, it's the entire query for SQL. For Rails, it's model, dot join, dot where, dot group, dot whatever you want. So it's the entire thing. It's the entire question that you want to answer. Notice I kind of double underlined these because a metric by itself could be total number of blogs, period. Or a metric could be total number of blogs by category. You're technically answering two, you could answer two different questions by this. You could use one metric as a base and then tack on a dimension later on if you want. So to glue this all together, fact, ta fact table, dimension, dimension filter, measure, metric, how many uh, comments, so that is what your um, column that you're focusing on with the aggregate, posts, that's your fact model, that's the main table you're looking at, created today, that is your filter, 
grouped by the post the uh, categories um, the posts category will be what you're grouping everything by and the whole thing is the metric that you're actually running yes Garrett yeah I ran out of color and I wanted to <laughs> this is red this is orange this is red this is orange so, okay <laughs> oh, all right. You can tell I didn't rush this at all. <laughs> yeah. So um, before we move on, we went through a lot of terminology. Any quick questions right now? What the hell I'm talking about? No. Okay. Good. <laughs> We'll get to that. Yes. <laughs> yes. All right. So all of this reporting in all these OLAB terms don't really work with relational databases unless your data is in what's called a star schema. Now, most of your Rails app are already more or less implementing star schema. It's a common design pattern for data warehouses, and it's built so your reports can be quick, especially if you index properly. The idea is you have all your questions you want to answer, you figure out your fact models, which happen to be your existing models, and you want to set up your fact models so they can quickly reach out to other tables to help answer questions. So like I said, your fact model holds the core information of your report in it. So a sale, a bank transaction, a blog post, a line of service. And the fact table commonly holds all the foreign keys that will reach out to any dimension that you want. Uh, and it can also hold the non-foreign keys for grouping by actual columns on it, so like a state or a cost center, that if it lives directly on the table, you can use that. Um, that is essentially star schema. I'll get a next slide has a chart to describe it a little better. The other option is snowflake schema, in which is basically star schema with more stuff tacked on at the end of it. So for example, uh, you have a sale that is, has a location. You could, within a star schema, have a table of every combination of every uh, city, state, country combination, um, known to man. That foreign key lives on the fact model. Uh, however, you would kind of get a lot of duplicate data. You have a lot of Indi cities from Indiana. You have a lot of cities from um, Illinois, etc. So what Snowflake will do is say, all right, you jump to the lowest level, which is city, and then city has a state, and then the state's table has a country. So imagine a star with your tables on each end. Let me show you. Jump to one table, then you would jump to another table and jump to another table. So the end result is this graph would look like a snowflake, essentially, with a lot of branches coming out of it. Uh, I personally am not a fan of snowflake schema. I prefer star because it's a bit more straightforward. Here's, an, here's the base example of it. Your fact table is in the middle, so posts, line of service, sales, whatever have you, and it reaches out to any dimension table that you actually want to work with. Direct one-to-one -one relation. Uh, in Rails land, this works essentially with any belongs to or any has one relation. It does not work pretty much at all with has minis. And to understand why, you have to understand how SQL works. If a blog, so a blog post has many comments, it's very difficult to ask, hey, what is the count of blog posts that have a comment with the word dog in it? The problem is the way SQL works is it'll join to the comments table, and if a blog has more than one comment, and if a, and if a blog has more than um, one comment with a dog matching in it, you will typically get back duplicate blog entries, so your accounts would essentially be skewed. The way around this is to throw a distinct on your select statement, but that can commonly screw up the rest of your query as well. So the general rule is if it's a has many relationship, it really can't be a, a dimension. There's certain ways around it, but it kind of gets a little messy. 
Um, and a, n another point is your dimension tables will have a lot of information where you can actually drill down into. So using uh, Moby as an example, we have a line of service. A line has a plan device, carrier, carrier count, and we'll say a status, if status lived on a, its own table. And your device has all the information to drill down from lowest level to model all the way up to technology, essentially. So your device table has those columns with all that information on it. The carrier has the uh, basically a name for the carrier, so AT&T, Verizon. That is your dimension label or dimension member. So when you get a report of all your lines for AT all your lines broken down by carrier, you see AT&T, Verizon, the actual names. That doesn't actually live on the line. The line just has the carrier ID on it. Does that sort of make sense? Straightforward? Okay. Using our fictitious company's example, we have a post. Post belongs to a blog, has a status, uh, has an author, has a category, and has a date that it was posted. The date doesn't live on the post, by the way. A date is an actual table. So why? This is called date dimensions. This is a trick where you can, instead of having a post at date column, you actually have an ID that talks to another table that has all the dates on it from the beginning where your company was founded to maybe let's just throw 20 years in advance. One row per day of the year. That row has the date, the, um, the month, the year, the day of the month, the quarter, the day of the week. What does this do? This is drill down information. You can go from show me all my blog posts from broken down by day to show me all my blog posts broken down by year. One join, you group by a different column at that point. The only other option would be to store all your information on posts and that can get a little messy. It's much easier just to do a jump. And if you're crafty with your ID column in your date dimension table, the ID can be a very nice uh, pattern to just look at the date and so you don't actually have to join against anything if you want to look directly on the table for any information. Does that make sense why you would want to have your date stored as a separate table and act as a regular relation instead? Okay. Great. So we learned a lot of terms. There's a lot of matching active record stuff. We can just use active record, right? Well, active record does provide all the information needed to form uh, RO lab queries. It knows about relationship information, so your has ones, belong tos. It knows how to group stuff together. It can filter stuff, your scopes, where, and any other gem you want to throw on top of it. And you can select out specific columns. You can use select, you can use pluck. So this should be great, right? Except for a couple things. Remember, we don't want actual active record objects back. So we're essentially having active record build a query for us and just run it. And active record does have a couple limitations to just flat out building a ad hoc query willy nilly. Um, I have not found a good way to group by stuff that is not also an aggregate that is not also a col another column on the table that you want. And this is mostly, this is definitely a Postgres thing. If you're working with Postgres, if you're using a group by clause, any column in your select statement that is not an aggregate must also be in the group by clause. So if we want all your blog, uh, count of all blog posts by author, you want to select out the count and then the author's table, uh, user's table dot username. That's going to also be near select clause. Now we also need to move that username into the group by clause as well, or the query will actually refuse to run. The more you slice and dice and break down the information, the wider your select statement's going to be, the more you're going to have to shove stuff in the group by statement. Now the group method in Active Record does let you just um, pass in a string of all your columns that you want. You can pass in a a uh, comma separated list of symbols for the columns on the fact table. There's not really a way to say, kind of like a, uh, the where method where you have a hash of 
table name and then the filter for that and active record kind of glues those together. Group do, the group method doesn't have that, unfortunately. So there's no way to actually tell active record, hey, go ahead and group by the stuff. You're good to go. Um, also, when you want to aggregate stuff, so active record has a maximum, a minimum, a count, an average method you can tack on active relation, and it'll actually use the SQL um, met, uh, functions to do that. Problem is, it will completely obliterate any handcrafted um, select cl clauses using the select method. It'll completely ignore it, and will typically only return one value. There is a way to have um, the group method work with an aggregate um, function in active record to return a hash of an object and then the aggregate, but we don't want active record objects. We just want a username back and account with it. So that doesn't really work. And it's not really a way to store pre-built queries with active record. You can shove stuff, you mean, yes, you can totally shove stuff in the table, but there's no way to and then go back here where we just stash I want to give me the total number of blogs and then later on, oh, I just want to tack on a group by category. Active Record really doesn't have a way to do that. You can store pre-built, you can start storing active relations in a query and then conditionally tack on a group by if you uh, want to, but there's no way to just reach into a pool and quickly grab something out. Was, okay, and there's n and I'll jump down to the last bullet point. There's no way to whitelist what your user can filter from with Active Record. Really, um, it's best you can throw a pre-built form in and mainly build a where clause or mainly shove it into ransack. But there's no way to say, oh, we don't want the user to filter by this because one, we don't have an index for this column. The query will be hella slow, or it actually doesn't make any sense. So what can you do? Well, you can use hard-coded active record queries, not very dry, and if you want to combine dimensions and filters, uh, you're going to be in if statement soup, pretty much. Uh, you can write a query yourself, well, where you just say, hey, active record, I want to group by this, I want to, I want to filter by this, build me a query. Um, Problem is, you can end up dirtying your models that way because you would need active, you would need to extend Active Record to describe what can you group by, what can you filter by, and Active Record's already bloated enough as it is. Adding more methods probably isn't the best thing you can do for uh, your app's uh, slow code. Uh, or you can switch to uh, the Squeal Gem. Squeal Gem is actually built to. Uh, programmatically generate queries pretty nicely through a interesting DSL. Um, unfortunately, at least for our app and most everybody's apps, uh, that chip has sailed or on active record. Unless you want to do a full rewrite, you ain't going to squeal. And uh, I don't think management will say, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm going to need five months to rewrite the app so you can get your reporting when management wants it not in three months. So what are your options? Well, I personally went with option two. Uh, it's a gym I'm currently working on called Active Reporting. The idea is a relatively simple DSL that works with Active Record, does not pollute Active Record, where you could define this is a fact model, this is going to be a dimension from my relations, this is a filter, and it allows you to use OLAPI terms to describe what you want to do in Ruby code, and it will work with Active Record to generate the query for you. Um, it's not done yet. Um, I was busy preparing a talk for tonight, so sorry. Uh, but it, it, it functions essentially. Just not quite done yet. And like I said, it does not dirty up Active Record. It effectively adds one method to the entire uh, Active Record. Um, system instead of everything. The idea behind it is similar to models. You have fact models, so app slash fact models, for example. Anything that you want to be a fact model, you would define in here. By default, it will say, oh, this is a post fact model. I'm going to assume you're talking about a post active record model 
or you can override it if you want to name your fact model something freaky, if you're so inclined. So you define, you define each of your fact models. You then say, all right, this fact model can be dimensioned on these things. So a post fact model, you can group by blog, group by category, group by any column in the table if you want. Remember, dimensions don't have to be relations. And you can define, so by default, so like I said, you want to give me a count of all posts for your blog to group by author. By default, you need to say, I don't want uh, integers back from my IDs. I want to know what to actually grab from the uh, uh, user's table. So you can define what label you want to use per fact model by default. So for example, a date dimension. You want to say, if ever I'm dimensioning by a date, I want to use the date column on the dates table. And you can also define your hierarchy so maybe a UI can walk through and say, all right, I'm defaulting to say, here's all your blog posts by day. OK, now I want to see it by month. Simple drop down, click. Dimension changes to group by month instead of the default group by day. And you can define your filters. Why are we write listing filters? Because scopes and active relation methods are class methods. What is also a class method? Destroy and delete all. We don't want users just randomly shoving filters into the UI, hacking our DOM, saying, oh yeah, I want to filter by delete all true and send that along. So the idea is you whitelist what your user can filter by. You can also then ask your fact models, hey, what are my available filters? So maybe I can dynamically build a UI for that. In this gym, a, filter can be, a dimension filter can be one of three things. You can say, oh, reach into the model of the scope, uh, reach into the model and use a scope, a pre-built scope. Or if you don't want to dirty up your active record models with a bunch of scopes, you can define the dimension filter using the lambda syntax like active record. Or you can say, I'm just going to let throw caution to the wind and hope Ransack writes me a nice where clause and just say, all right, title contains, title equals, user name uh, contains, there's your like with a wild card that is super slow, but you can do that if you want. And then finally, you described all your fact models, so now we can actually build metrics. We can build pre-built, in this case, objects that hold the uh, questions that, we, that we, we can describe questions to it for answers later. So for this example, we have one metric, we're going to call it post count by author. We say our fact model is the post fact model, and we're going to dimension on author. This will effectively say select count on our posts and our uh, username, uh, users username from posts, join against users, group by the username, or group by the user ID and the username, because you have to have everything in the group by clause. And that is in your uh, uh, select clause. Or here's another uh, metric, uh, comment count. Uh, by default, the gym will assume you want a count. You can then say you want a sum of all the common counts. Spoiler alert, post has a counter cache on it for the number of counts on it, for the number of comments on it. Sum all those together. You can then say how many uh, com uh, comments total broken down by category, for example. And this all rolls into a report object. So I separated out a metric from an actual report that executes the query so you can store pre-build metrics in a database or just in a in-memory array of various objects. So you can have a stash ready to go saying, all right, I want the count of something and tack on extra dimension filters from the input, glue, those, glue the metric and this other extra user input together and run. So this, so this example, building a comment count, and then a request comes through saying, I want to build a chart for this. I'm going to use, that should be M2. This is beta, I remind everybody. Um, I want to make a report using this metric as a base, tack on another dimension. I want to group by the blog, and also I only want stuff from these two blogs. So the idea is you have a container full of pre-built, ready-to-run reports, and you then 
add on top of that as you need it. Does that sort of make sense? Okay. The deer in the headlight looks are concerning me. That's okay. You said you can keep it in the database. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, yeah so um, a name, the de fact model, the default measure, the aggregate as columns, and then on the fly, build a metric, and then tack on the extra stuff in front of it if you want. So the report plan is in the database, not the results, right? Correct, yeah. The, the, the pre-built what, you what your base is, and then you can tack on, oh, the user, uh, the uh, UI said, oh, also dimensioned by a blog, and throw on these filters. So running that same, we have that report object. Running that, we get back a nice array of hashes. Common count. Uh, my gem also throws in the, identif the uh, identifier what, of whatever dimension you're doing. So we're dimensioning by blog. We're getting back a blog ID, as well as a uh, nice label. We are, the dimension label for a blog is title. And so we get back the actual title of the blog. So this blog has a common count of this. This other blog has a common count of that. And that's the query that the gem essentially generates based on all this basic information that you pass in. Probably should have another site that has that with that next to it. Great. My gem can sort of do many things, but it's not magical. Um, you're still bound by limitations of active record. The biggest issue I have ever seen with working with active record and especially with filtering is if you have a if you have more than one one relation on the same model that goes to the same table. So so for example, you have a support ticket that has an assignee and the support ticket uh, the who made it. Those are both users. They both they are both go to the same user's model. They're named differently though. However, good luck if you say, um, give me the support tickets, and I'm going to need the creator and the assignee where the creator name is this and the assignee is that. Active record has no way of taking a join against two um, relations that go to the same uh, table and separate out individual filters from them. Yes? So, when, you know, can you go back one slide to your yes. return results? Yeah. Um, Let's say you've got another dimension mm -hmm. added there, other than just blog identifier. Mm -hmm. what, would, what would your uh, return results look like? Would it just be like one result for each unique combination? Of yes. Of yes. This is effectively a row coming back from this query. Sure. Uh, so if you want to also dimension on only the common count per uh, by blog by category, right. you will have common count blog identifier, blog, category identifier, and the category name for each combination that comes back from the database. <laughs> so yeah, uh, unfortunately that's just a limitation of active record now. If anyone can figure out how to not screw that up, please tell me, because it's a big problem in Moby too. Yes, Jimmy? Uh, have you experienced any limitations if someone made decisions to kind of use default scopes or have Oh yeah, avoid default scopes like the plague. For the, God damn it, do not use default scopes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Alright, uh, so... Yeah, yeah. So other, data, uh, other database configurations, when you're building stuff or reporting, try to avoid doing as many jumps as possible to other tables. Go one deep in stop if possible. You can sort of get around this if you want to use a uh, has one through to say to act like you're doing one jump to another table. The query will still do uh, two join clauses, but you can at least in you know OLAPI terms saying you're dimensioning by one thing. And keep in mind you're you know getting hit with another join against the database. As I mentioned before, uh, starring Snow Snowflake does not work with many to minis because of the fact you could get duplicate rows back unless you use a distinct and I advise using uh, against using distinct because that can actually screw up your entire query. Uh, index liberally, especially on your foreign keys. Um, anything that you would commonly filter by you want to throw an index on. Also look into multi-key um, 
indexes. If you're filtering by multiple things at the same time, your database can use one index instead of two or none of them for that matter. Um, explain and explain analyze if you're on Postgres land is your best friend. This query is taking 20 seconds. Why? Oh, it's not using a, um, an index. We probably should add an index to something. And when you're adding indexes, your inserts will be slower. Not really slow enough for anyone to really notice, but just keep that in mind. Your indexes will grow with your tables. Uh, look into uh, read-only replication slaves for reporting stuff. That way you have your transaction stuff hitting a master, and then all of your heavy-hitting queries can hit read-only slaves that only reporting is using and not your day-to-day -day stuff. Also, as you grow, looking, look into uh, sharding, or if you're in Postgres land, possibly separating out individual tenant data via different schemas. It'll effectively shrink the database size per tenant, so queries can run faster that way because you're working with less physical data at that point. And finally, this is great. You're eventually going to outgrow this. This works for small, medium to medium largest size databases, um, especially if you're reporting on the transactional data or um, OLTP, which is online transactional processing. That is your day-to-day -day support tickets coming in, support calls coming in, orders coming in. Like I said, you can report on those, but you're, st you're basically combining, I want very quick uh, selects with I want very quick inserts because I'm doing day-to-day -day operations. And eventually as your data grows with transactional data, your aggregates will start to slow down as well over time. Um, indexes help, but eventually if you get into the terabyte land of data, you may run into issues at that point. Um, a way around that is to start actually data warehouse some of this stuff. Don't invest in in-memory data cubes, but maybe, maybe build roll-up tables for historical data. So you've had a month full of uh, orders come in. All right, let's have a background job that goes through each one of them, sums up some aggregate information, and shove that into tables, into a larger flat table that has aggregate information pre-set up because that information is done. Those orders are complete. You don't need to worry about them anymore. They shouldn't change because they're done throw them in another table, report on that. That way you have historical data and that's much faster because you have stuff pre-calculated out. The only trade-off for that is whenever you do an aggregate, you can lose certain information because you can't group by certain columns anymore if you're grouping by like a sum of uh, certain financial information and you can't group by a cost center anymore because how do you combine those together if all you want is the final sum of a certain set of sales? I, that was a horrible analogy. I just I hope that helped. <laughs> Any a aggregating, you commonly will lose information is where this comes from. So what if you've got a situation mm -hmm. where you've got something that's basically like a roll-up table, mm -hmm. but sometimes there are not not additions to previous data, mm -hmm. but revisions to previous data where there's like a mistake. Well, you would need to build the system to either blow out that section of info and re-roll it, um, or make it so it's, I guess, idempotent enough so you can run the same system again and it will either f create a new record or find and update an existing one. That's the best way around it. Oh, and you find out who made the mistake and beat them. <laughs> <laughs> or you kind of have like either like a policy for your application or that like you just kind of say like after five years like you can't right. augment this data anymore. Right. So this is the, the, the time has passed. This is history. You're not going to rewrite history. At least that's the theory behind it. And then real life happens. And then you cry. <laughs> and then you rerun the script to reroll the data. Uh, so that's basically all I have. Um, like I said, this is Jim still Jim's on GitHub. It functions has minimal documentation. Um, this presentation has the most documentation I ever wrote for how to do the gym. It's effectively what I just did. You have the gym, you make your fact models, and it go. You go essentially build your metrics. Um, in case anyone's interested, I have a copy of these slides. 
and I'll correct the spelling mistake um, on, my, on this GitHub repo, and uh, any uh, death threats can be sent to my Twitter. Uh, any questions? Yes? Mm -hmm. Don't say PDF. Well, Never say. That is my theory. Um, video games may get in the way, but uh, yeah, yeah. This uh, this this gym is effectively a. Clean room, but from memory, watered down implementation that Moby sort of uses. Um, obviously, all the Moby isms removed, and I'm starting clean so I can fix a lot of mistakes mistakes that were in the design process for Moby that we can't get back. But I mean, this is effectively how you describe OLAP in Ruby Land. So you run this against your production database, right? Mm -hmm. Did you, was the start scheme actually there, or did you have to do some work? It effectively was already there. Um, some cases we went back and added, call, added extra columns so we're not doing multiple jumps to other tables. So the, the star scheme example on Moby, a, carry, a carrier account has a carrier, but we don't want to. But it's much easier just to slap on the the carrier ID with the carrier account ID, and just keep them in sync, so we can quickly say, "Hey, show me all the AT and T lines." So obviously, Ruby has a lot of methods and mm -hmm. uh, date manipulation functionality mm -hmm. and other stuff. What was the reason behind the decision to move to just a table relation based on the ID of dates? Because it's quicker to have Postgres say group by this. Than have Ruby manipulate it. Sure. This effectively. There's also a concept called time dimension, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's date dimension, but all the seconds in a day. Does that really help that table that you was talking about? Does that really help with more like the users throwing dynamic stuff at you? Uh, I want to suddenly change the date to a different date range. Uh, it, it, yeah, it, it, it can. It, it's mainly good for like month over month or day over the day line graphs. So you can just you, you, you just group by you just group by it. I'm just using an example for a hierarchy. If you wanted to be able to zoom in and zoom out for certain dates, technically a JavaScript front end with a charting library can almost do that for you. If you just throw in all the dates, but then you're getting a crap ton of data back that may not even be seen. Yeah. Yeah. The, basically, the gym handles building the query, and it tells the database, "Hey, here's a big complex thing for you to do. Do it because you're faster, and you actually have all the data to work with." Oh, yes, Miles? I have a question, and then I have a bad joke related to your talk. Okay. Um, you can turn off the video now if you want. <laughs> First question is, uh, are there good resources for further reading on OLAP, OLAP? Uh, Not going to lie, you could almost throw it in Google okay. and just see what you come back. You'll, you'll get some, a lot of talk and a lot of examples would be, um, more towards Oracle and MS SQL, especially like ta the uh, table diagrams, with Hungarian notation for your column names, all that good stuff. But effectively, the, the, the idea is the same. Um, and then my joke is, 
considered instead of active reporting, calling it Star Schema and Hutch? <laughs> <laughs> I'm never coming here again. <laughs> all right. All right. That's all I got.